Welcome to This Week in Venture Capital. I'm excited. We're on episode number seven, and today we have with us Dana Settle from Graycroft Partners. Welcome. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Dana, you have a brand new fund, which must feel great. Uh, yes, it definitely feels great to, uh, to have a new fund. <laughs> yes, so it's a $130 million fund, and you guys were able to raise that at a period of time where venture capital firms are actually struggling to raise money. Um, why don't we step back and just do a little introduction of yourself and your background? Uh, sure. So um, my background largely has always been in, in sort of business development with uh, technology or technology-enabled companies, starting with uh, Macaw Cellular back in uh, back in the mid '90s, um, and uh, and bidding on cellular licenses um, in India and sort of other parts of the world. So um, that was a different kind of business development than what most of my portfolio companies do now. But you actually worked for Macaw Cellular? I did, did that? yeah. Okay. So uh, essentially started there as an intern in college and then ended okay. up going uh, full time to run a bidding process uh, where we bid on cellular licenses in India. Excellent. So that was, uh, that, was, that was job one. Did you spend a bunch of time over in India? I did, yes. In that must have been in fascinating. In 1995 and then went back for the first time actually two years ago. Things changed Very quite a bit. Very different place. Yeah. <laughs> Very different place. For one thing, several hundred million, uh, cell, you know, cellular subscribers, which there were zero when we right. were there. So, you know, I amazing. spent I spent a bit of time in India myself, and for me, it was phenomenal going to Bangalore, for example, and just seeing modern building structures and office space Crazy. and very leading technology and high-speed bandwidth. And oh yeah, no, and and especially comparing it to '95, you know, to to modern, you know, to today, where essentially in '95 there was. There was really very little telecommunication. Period. I mean, in you know most of the towns outside of the major cities, people didn't have phones. So. Right, and if I understand correctly, you know, obviously India, a country of more than a billion people, um, overwhelming number of households still don't have cellular phones. Uh, so still don't have normal phones. Landlines, Landlines. right? They went straight to straight, straight to, to mobile. Yeah. Right. yeah, And that obviously has implications for how people roll out websites. But you left there and went into venture capital. Why? Well, Macaw was sold to AT&T actually while we were going through the bidding process uh, in India. And um, most of, a number of the guys at Macaw actually were former investment bankers. And so okay. they told me that I should go work in investment banking and sort of earn my stripes. So I, so I did it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, actually moved back to New York and went to work for Lehman Brothers uh, in New York in their media and communications practice. Okay. Lehman Brothers used to be an investment bank. I remember. <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> back in the day. Um, and uh, so did that for two years, was in New York for a year, San Francisco for a year, moved out there in 96, and really everything was just sort of taking off on the internet and ended up, um, you know, for better or worse, being recruited at a relatively early age to Mayfield to a venture fund um, okay. in uh, 1998. So. And what level did you enter? As a at associate, I mean, okay. which, you know, in effect was an analyst. I mean, I was 25. And, and, and how long did you work at Mayfield for? Uh, I was there for six years. Two of those years, I was actually back in business school. I went back to business school in 2001, okay. um, back to Harvard, and then uh, came back. Uh, back to Mayfield afterward, but I, and I actually worked through uh, business school. So okay, and then you left uh, Mayfield, and you didn't go directly to Graycroft Partners. You had a diversion. I had a diversion. Yeah. Um, I, I, <laughs> I joined a small fund uh, okay. based in San Francisco. That, that wasn't that, what I was going to talk thanks, about. That's okay. Business but development. But as part of that, but yes. as part of that, ended up uh, actually running business development for um, two companies. Um, and actually, I thought this was kind of interesting. Two companies at the same time because they were yeah. both very early stage. They really didn't need a full time business development person. Right. But I had uh, invested in them and. Um, decided to to do that and there was a lot of a lot of complementary um, relationships that that came to bear on both of them do so you find any of your companies doing that with business development I have a very close friend his name is Jeff Yolen and he's sure. he's actually Harvard yeah. business school alum if you know, and I Jeff. know him but not from Harvard but yes okay. <laughs> um, yeah so he's a good friend and you know what he's been able to do he works a little bit in VC um, but he also works for several companies doing business development at the same time because the idea being most early stage companies, the founder is the lead biz dev person, mm -hmm. but they often either if they come from a product or technical background or just frankly don't have the time given capital raising and hiring and sales and everything else to do biz dev, 
And I know Jeff works across several companies doing biz dev. Is that something you see in your portfolio companies? Is it the norm? You know, it's certainly not the norm. Um, I think, I mean, I don't know if you can do it across several, but I, I definitely felt like for me at the time when I was doing it with two, and I felt like I probably could have maybe done, you know, one more. Yeah. I think the benefit was in both those cases, the founders were more product, you know, <clears throat> technical, uh, technically focused and, and had technical backgrounds. So they didn't have a lot of those relationships. Yeah. So that's sort of point one. Point okay. two is, you know, it is interesting. It helps keep your relationships fresh if you have more than one thing to talk about. Right. If you think about it, you know, you sort of go in and you're talking to somebody at, you know, whether it's an ad agency or Disney or you name it, you know, if you're sort of, you can only call them once about one thing. Right. If you have a couple of things and you do have more things to uh, to keep talk to them about. And, them. and, and you know, a lot of it is they want to know, you know, what's, what's going on outside of their world so, and what is cutting edge. So, so as it relates yeah. to entrepreneurs, not a bad idea for them to consider individuals like this. And in fairness to Jeff, he doesn't do five at a time. Yeah, he does yeah, no, two I assume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, look, you know, it's not something that we've done in our portfolio. I think actually in one case, um, we had a, a salesperson that we were sharing between two of our companies in the mobile space. Um, you know, I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's a crazy idea, but I think you just have to be very specific about the objectives, you know, for the business development person or for the salesperson. Okay. So. And then you joined Graycroft. It was, did you join when Graycroft was set up or was the fund already set up? Graycroft didn't exist. It didn't exist. It, so so I, um, I actually uh, met Alan Patrikoff, who really is the, the founder of Graycroft, although we all sort of founded it together. Right. Um, and Alan was uh, formerly, formerly had been the founder of Apex Partners, which is, you know, now a multi multi-billion dollar Is it private true? So, equity firm. Yeah, and so, so I lived in London yeah. for uh, for a decade and Apex was probably the best known brand name yeah. or one of the top mm -hmm. three or four brand names in private equity. They kind of exited venture capital, I think, uh, they, mostly. Yeah, they did. I mean, I think that they did um, largely exit venture capital um, after sort of 2000, 2001. Yeah. Um, they had a you know big Silicon Valley office um, prior to that. But um, what I would say is that as part of that, Alan personally has always loved early stage companies, and that was right. really his, those were his roots. And he had ended up partnering with people largely in Europe who had more of the private equity background, and that's how Apex became a. And is it true? Apex stands for Alan, Alan Patrickoff, Patrick. and what is X? Depends on who you ask, <laughs> but yes, I would say that Alan Patrickoff uh, and Company. From what I understand, it's Alan Patrickoff um, and. Uh, International? What's the X? I can't remember. Alan, Alan, if you're around, send a note in. <laughs> <laughs> but it is Alan Patrickoff. Yes. And he's sort of a legend in the investment circles and having been involved Certainly. with it for many years. Yeah. Uh, what year was Graycroft established? So Graycroft one was established in 2006. So we okay. really, I mean, I met Alan for the first time January of 2006. We sort of sat down and talked about the concept of, it's really a small fund concept. Okay. And um, focusing on companies in the digital media, consumer internet, and wireless areas that were lower capital requirement companies. And we started in, in 2006 and raised the fund really in, in, I guess closed it in May, all from individuals. So it was a very different fundraising process than okay. the most recent one. And uh, well, let's talk about the original fund was $75 million? Yes. And this idea of micro funds, I don't know if we're gonna call them micro funds, but smaller than traditional mm -hmm. VC, seems to gather a lot of press attention uh, and a lot of industry attention. If you look at, for example, First round capital, that was their strategy. If you look at, I think Foundry Group, they would say mm -hmm. that was their strategy. I think Union Square Ventures is slightly smaller than the histor historical uh, VCs. Why is that interesting? Well, I, I mean, at the time that we were starting in 2006, I mean, I think those really were the only other funds that were sort of pursuing the, you know, whether it's micro, you know, fund strategy or however you want to define it. Um, uh, the reason that it's interesting is I think when you look at sort of the reality of capital requirements for companies, especially in these areas that we're investing, which are not, you know, life sciences companies, they're not companies that, you know, should need to raise, you know, 50, 100 million dollars. I mean, these are companies that should be able to get a product up and running for less than a million dollars. Right. And so that was really the, the theory behind a smaller fund, because when you have a large fund, you need to put large dollars to work. Right. And so what we had all seen, and I, you know, I had seen sort of from my, you know, my past, um, you know, largely in, in Silicon Valley is you, know, you have these larger funds that essentially are, are, are writing bigger checks and not sure whether or not the companies actually need the levels of capital that they're, you know, that they're raising, and I think to a certain degree, it had been, the model had been sort of flipped over to where 
companies were raising the amount of money that venture capitalists wanted to give them, not necessarily that was you know, sort of the right amount of money for the companies. It's, it's not always the case, but. It strikes me that the venture market is segmenting. <clears throat> I'm noticing this kind of what people are calling super angel category, whether it's Founder Collective mm -hmm. on the East Coast, sure. uh, Felicity Ventures, or so Soft Tech is Jeff Clavier, mm -hmm. uh, his group, uh, Dave McClure, that kind Dave of, Maples, yeah. you know, yeah. let's say 25 million or under here in Southern California, we have Crosscut and Rincon mm -hmm. uh, Venture Partners. Uh, as the people who can write a $200,000 check or a $500,000 or a $100,000 and sometimes pre-product. And then the next stage, which is let's call it $50,000, $75,000, million, where the check size might be $750K, a million dollars. You might like to see product launch. You might like to see the first uh, crack on revenue to prove that mm -hmm. there's monetization. And then the traditional A round funds are probably in the $200 million range where they're wanting to write two to $3 million checks. And then the traditional, I don't know, growth equity firms, but let's call it B round venture mm -hmm, capital mm -hmm. firms that might have funds of four to $500 million and can write the 10 or $15 million checks. Mm -hmm. And we've seen a lot of that lately. We've talked a lot about Lightspeed, for example, that's come in on a lot mm -hmm. of deals lately. Uh, Living Social being one, uh, Shoe Dazzle being another. It strikes me that this is a good thing because if you get segmentation in the VC market, you can meet the needs of all stages of business. Does that sound about right? I think that's right. I mean, you know, we we philosophically really believe in syndicating sort of, you know, as early as possible yeah. just to have, you know, all the right people around the table. And, and also, syndicating meeting, uh, bringing in bringing other investors. Bringing in multiple, yeah, multiple parties, whether it's, you know, angel groups along with us or other mm -hmm. venture funds. Um, I think that uh, the only the only sort of problem I guess that I see with what you're what you're talking about is that you know I really fundamentally believe that companies should you know go out and raise the amount of money that they need to achieve profitability or need to achieve some other major milestone right. and have that other major milestone not just be another funding round. Right. And I think there's a little bit of that creeping into the market right now where you know, it's kind of you know I got to like my goal is to get to where I can raise another 10 million dollars and that doesn't seem consistent with building a great business. Unless it's to raise money from the Russians and correct, put $20 million in, in it. your pocket. Yeah, exactly. So. But um, no, but I, I, I accept that. And I think for me, fundraising is not really a milestone. I always used to say to people when I was running companies, I didn't celebrate fundraising because all fundraising did was mean I had more obligations and a higher <laughs> exit price, right? So I actually didn't celebrate customer wins because I also thought that, that was yes. the, a <laughs> lot more work. To actually yeah. provide the service or a product. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, okay, I did celebrate yeah. a little bit customer wins, yes. but you know what I mean? Yes. Um, but I would say this, not every company these days should be a company that raises $2 million and sells for 40. Those totally companies, agree. as long as they don't raise too much money, the founders can make great money, the sure. investors can make good returns. And then some of them, you notice they're taking off, and it may make sense. I know a deal we're going to talk about, Guilt Group here. It may make sense for them to be hugely capitalized sure. as other players try to enter the market. And in the old days, it might have been, not the old days, let's say the, the bubble days, it might have been I do an IPO and now suddenly I have $200 million. Oh use it as an acquisition currency, use it to ramp up staff, use it to keep other people out of the market, use it to compete with people like Absolutely. Amazon. So I do think there are times where it makes sense. I totally agree. I mean, look, I think if you're going for sort of the winner takes all, you know, market space, yeah. then you almost have to do that. But but do it once you have the once you have the model proven. What do you so. think of the idea of the fat company? Did you read Ben Horowitz's piece on the fat no, company? No, I didn't. So he he had I'll describe it to you. Yeah. Um, he had a very controversial piece. You know, Silicon Valley has this idea of the lean startup. Mm -hmm. And I think it was tongue-in-cheek tongue in because yeah. he's a, quite a smart, yeah. successful guy. But I think he called it the fat startup. And he was saying there's all this emphasis on under-raising capital and, you know, being ramen profitable. And he was saying, you know, in a winner-takes-all market, if you want to have Silicon Absolutely. Valley size outcomes, sometimes the fat company makes sense, which is, if you perceive you're going to be the market leader, maybe you should raise mm -hmm. $50 million and be a real leader. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, look, I mean, I think it's it's 
case by case. And that's why I think guilt group, I think that they've done the right thing. I mean, I think as far as going out and raising a huge round, as much as I sort of wish that they had, you know, raised a smaller round and we could have gotten in, you know, <laughs> earlier on, but that's okay. Um, uh, you know, I think they are in that kind of market space and they have that kind of momentum. So I think it makes sense. Same yeah. thing. I mean, we're in Huffington Post and, you know, same thing goes there where they did go out and raise a, you know, a much bigger round to essentially really win that market. And they're proving a whole new market. And they had gotten to the point where they had, you know, I think proven enough that the model was working, that they could do that. Right. I want to uh, talk about one other concept before we go into deals of the week. Graycroft, as we said earlier, has raised a $130 million fund. Your target is, or your office base is New York, LA. Mm -hmm. Does that mean you primarily want to invest in those markets, or are you equally indifferent wherever you invest? Well, I would say um, we certainly want to invest in these markets because we think that they're two very underserved markets. Yeah. You know, if you sort of look at the capital available, well, I mean, it's obviously I yeah, preaching agree. to the choir. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, you know, so so I think we absolutely want to either invest in these markets or in companies that need access to these markets. Okay. So I, I would say that's sort of how they're how they're defined, and in the you know the space that we focus on, digital media and and sort of you know, mobile and consumer internet. I mean, they tend to be markets that do need access to these uh, to the companies and, and executives. Given in that it is the largest city in America, New yeah. York City, and the <laughs> second largest city in America, Los right. Angeles, I'm imagining most companies would like access Correct. to these two markets. Correct. What are the differences between New York and LA? I might preface this by saying New York seems to be trendy right now, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. I mean. They seem to have this resurgence of attention and excitement and enthusiasm. And I might say relative to Boston, where it's been the traditional hotbed of venture capital, what's going on in New York? Well, I think what's going on in New York is sort of twofold. I mean, one, a lot of companies <clears throat> have been uh, founded in New York and have really, and right now there's you know a lot of heat in the whole kind of ad tech area. And obviously, it's where a lot of the largest advertising agencies are and clients, right. et cetera. So you sort of have that. The second thing is, um, well, I should say there are three, three things. The second thing is you have a lot there's of really smart. There's always isn't? three. I know. It's I can't three. believe I said two. And you, have to, you have to make up the third, right? <laughs> no, exactly. Even if you have to make it exactly. up, there's In this always case, three I don't have things. To, so that's yeah. great. No. <laughs> um, so the second thing really is um, is that you have a lot of very smart, uh, you know, unemployed or or folks sort of leaving employment from hedge funds. Right. And that the the skill set is actually very transferable, I think, to a lot to of what's it. going on in ad tech. Okay. So if you think about you know sort of trading exchanges and things. Right. That really, I mean, you know, are are um, in a lot of ways um, perfect kind of analogs from the from the financial trading markets. Right. So um, I think you're seeing some r great talent there. Um, and the third thing is, uh, especially as it compares to LA, I would say that New York is very concentrated, and that's one of the things that I think is a challenge in LA. Is you know, it's it's just geographically so dispersed. And right. so, and I think, you know, you have a, a much sort of broader range of industry um, ranging from, you know, San Diego up through Santa Barbara, if you look at it sort of geographically, and then, you know, really everything as far as, uh, as far as um, industry. And, you know, obviously everybody focuses on LA and the media industry, but that's certainly, you know, one of many things that goes on in LA. Um, you know, it's interesting, you talk about quant uh, quantitativeness of the, online advertising space. I know Roger Ehrenberg uh, is very big. He's a New York investor, um, and he's very big on businesses that have quantitative components to them. And uh, so we spent some time talking about this. It seems that what's happened historically is online advertising was purchased by very young people uh, through agencies. They may be in their 20s. Big buys were done, multi-million dollar buys, uh, in an RFP, a request for proposal type process, very inefficient process for buying uh, inventory. And it seems like the market may be moving to more of a market mechanism. You had Right Media uh, was acquired by Yahoo. You had uh, Ad ECN acquired by Microsoft. You have Google, of course, uh, never having been in the display market, doing it all through exchanges. And this idea that maybe in the future, you don't need as much as many people involved in an inefficient process, but maybe people are buying real time in the way you buy and sell pork bellies. Is that it? Yeah, I think that's, I mean, exactly. And I think that is the, the direction that the market's moving. And I think that we'll see that, you know, even now, probably some even more interesting things happening as we move from kind of, you know, static or even dynamic web pages to the stream. Right. 
So. Good. Listen, I, I want to make sure to thank our sponsor today. Uh, we have a sponsor called PickClick. If you watch the show, you would have heard of them before. What PickClick does, Dana, is they allow you to, on eBay and Etsy, create a visual search metaphor. So instead of drilling down, doing text search, seeing a bunch of text, and then clicking through to the image to see what you're buying, you type in your term, it'll actually give you kind of a visual dashboard to kind of drill down. Interesting story about PickClick. Uh, Ryan, who created it, uh, had previously done this on Craigslist with a product called ListPick um, and had a great degree of success until Craigslist shut him down. And I remember, you know, there's a term that everyone uses these days, mashup. I think the original mashup or the original popular mashup was one that was called um, uh, housing maps, housingmaps.com. And what they did is they mapped uh, your Google map on one side with your Craigslist um, visual image and plotting where the images were on a map. And it made it really easy to, to actually search for stuff. And that housing maps, list pick, which Ryan created, which I don't know why Craigslist shut down, and now pick click is his next version, iteration of that. I think it's a powerful metaphor for how you find information on the web. Sure. Sound, sound yeah, about right? Yeah, absolutely. Good. Uh, well, that one you're not allowed to disagree Thank with. They're you. a sponsor. Uh, but exactly. The, <laughs> but the truth is we have here, both at Mahalo and myself, have played around a great deal with mm -hmm. the product. We're very grateful to Ryan and to PickClick, P-I-C-C-L-I-C-K, PickClick.com. Thank you for sponsoring the show. Let's talk about the deals. And we, every week, have something we call the deal of the week. The deal of the week this week is Guilt Group, a company I know you know well. Let me just give the stats here. Uh, they have raised $83 million, so this kind of meets that fat startup category, $83 million in venture capital. They just did a $35 million round with General Atlantic Leading and Matrix uh, Partners. Uh, they are in what people are calling the private sale marketplace. What's going on? Why so much capital in the Guilt Group, and are you positive on it, negative on it? I've been I've been positive on Guilt Group for a long time. I think the private sale sort of category certainly has gotten a lot of heat and and potentially or I would say very likely overheated. Yeah. Um, you know I think there was one exit with uh, with Rue La La, um, but um, you know look I think that there it's it's hard to differentiate in this in this space because most of the manufacturers essentially you know will give their product to. You know, folks, if they've got a big list of people that they're going to sell it to, and they and may or may not have to take inventory. Define give your product because yeah, that's may the or key may not, to right. it, right? So may or may not have to take inventory, and you know, obviously they're trying to offload inventory, and so if you are having to take it, you. So I want to stop you because just to yeah. be sure, if anyone who doesn't know, the way the industry was born in the United States, the brands themselves. It's not like they were shipping their goods to Guilt Group and saying, okay, you can have my excess inventory. You can buy it on 15 cents on the dollar and whatever you sell for, you sell for it. That's not what's happening. They're saying, I have inventory. If you can move that inventory, move it. Go for it. Go yeah. for it. Uh, but, but the risk is not borne initially, at least by the Guilt Group. Correct. And therefore, I could take that inventory. I wonder... Can I, do I pledge it to three or four people, or do they have an exclusive time window on that inventory? Yeah, I don't. I mean, I, I have to. They almost, I don't know, but they I think almost that have to have. They, some they sort must of time have some sort of time window. But also, I mean, I think that one of the things that you know, Guilt Group had done well from the beginning is they just they had a very clear, um, uh, you know, sort of message and membership. Meaning, you know, that they had sort of the top million shoppers in the country early on. Yeah. Um, and I think by doing that, you know, they really focused on the high end. They had very clear messaging and. Um, you know, they went to brands that all sort of made sense. And so they, um, you know, were able to take inventory and to, and to actually move that inventory because they had such a high sell-through rate because they right. just really knew. I mean, what I would say is they did the equivalent of just awesome merchandising and really knew their, their market the, from the, the beginning. And the group was founded by a, a kind of startup incubator that Kevin, Kevin Ryan, Ryan and yeah. I think his brother was involved with. I'm not sure, but, but Kevin, Kevin Ryan, Ryan the founder and then Matrix of early on. Yeah. 
Double, of double click. click. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. They, they had they had formed a few businesses, and we had seen a few yep. of them in that incubator. And Gilt Group just went crazy. And Gilt, it, Gilt Group went crazy. I think it was you know it was sort of taking a model that had worked in in France and Europe, Bon Privé, and then uh, you know replicating it and sort of um, changing it to work in this market. So you know I think it's it's interesting. I mean they raised 50 million. I mean this latest round was really just a, a, a sort of follow on from their existing investors. There wasn't a new investor that came in. And or was General Atlantic previously in Geo the? Geo was in the, in the $50 in million dollar okay. round that they did, and, and um, uh, Matrix was in the first round with Kevin Ryan. So, you know, I think that these guys sort of going out and doing the fat startup, if you will, makes a lot of sense um, because they are going to need it in order to move into all the categories that they so have. So the other companies, obviously, Rue La La, which was bought by GSI Commerce, Hot Look, which is here in Los Angeles, ideally, um, I know that Comcast lost, launched one called Swirl. Is, is there room in the market for four or five of these? Personally, I think it's going to be tough. I think it's going to be tough. You know, maybe there's room for two or three. I don't know if you go, you know, go much beyond that. I think the reality is that at a certain point, you know, you run out of inventory, you run out of excess inventory, hasn't, pricing hasn't, adjusts. Hasn't the market taught us that a lot of these types of markets are winner take all? Is that what's going on yeah. here? Thirty-five million dollars goes in to say if it's winner takes all, we better be winner. I, I think so, especially in again, sort of in their category. I mean, I think what Gilt has done is carved out the high end of the market, and I think that they're now moving into other categories. They're not necessarily trying to move into the mass market, at least not now. And I certainly am not privy to their current strategy, but it looks like they're really, you know, carving out the high end and going into other verticals. So, you know, they've got Jet Setter for travel. They've got. Um, you know, Gilt Men's, they've got uh, Gilt Noir, which is their very sort of high-end, you know, black label. I think what a lot of people don't realize is that in Europe, where these markets started, Vent Privé was the innovator mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from France, became the fastest growing internet company ever in France. Mm -hmm. Then in Germany, you had a, a group called Brands for Friends. Mm -hmm. All these, Both these companies grew very quickly. But what the situation in Europe was is you didn't have a robust second-hand marketplace mm -hmm. for dumping inventory. In the U.S., of course, You're we have TJ, TJ Maxx, Max, yeah. you have yeah. Lomans, you sure. have other. And so there's going to be a lot of channel conflict yeah. as, <clears throat> you know, if these companies are doing 100 million, 150 million, 200 million in top line sales, I think it starts to get noticed from that channel. If they're doing, five, I mean, these guys, it's, it claims in, in gross revenues, Four hundred and fifty million dollars projected. I've heard but yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> a lot of revenue. Yes. Uh, there's going to be some channel conflict, isn't there? Because like, uh, I think TJ sure. Maxx does six billion dollars in sure, sales. Sure. These guys are going to come out fighting, yeah. aren't they? But that's why I think. I mean, you know, again, I, I I think that their strategy ultimately. I mean, I heard one, and I don't know if this is you know sort of a true story or urban myth, but. Um, where you know guilt when they did one uh, the Christian Louboutin shoe sale you know they sold out in I don't know how many seconds and they had like twenty thousand mm -hmm. people on the wait list and uh, you know at a certain point Louboutin starts making product for them really right I mean I, I'm just saying that's now that's an example that's I don't you know can if imagine that's, happening. right because you think about it and it's like if they have access to that. I mean, you know, these are six hundred dollar shoes on sale. Right. If you have, if you can move that number, that much product. Do you own a pair? It's, it's possible. <laughs> I got it. I got it. Ultra, ultra discounted. Yeah. But, um, but uh, you know, if you can move that kind of product and with that market, so then you've, then you've really is, carved out yeah, an edge. If you have a very large subscriber base you become a powerful distribution channel absolutely. for brands. Absolutely, and if you think about it, I mean, it's where <clears throat> traditional retailers are kind of scrambling because they don't have that one-to-one -one connection with the consumer that somebody online does, like Gilt, where they're, I mean, Gilt talks to you every day. And Gilt knows who those people are. Gilt knows who, absolutely. Right, and they have a lot more information on them. Just before we go into our next deal, and we've got- Can I get to ask you what you think about Gilt, given that oh. you guys are the retail gurus? We oh, are? sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Listen, I will say this. Number one, I believe winner take all in this category. That does not mean number two, number three, number four don't have decent exits. I think if you are not going to end up being number one, you should start thinking about exiting early while this market is still really hot. There's a couple things people don't think about. Number one, I do believe that channel conflict that those guys are going to get their elbows out. And I think it doesn't create room, I don't believe, for five or ten of these. Number two, um, there was a unique period of time called 2008, 2009, where there was tons of excess inventory because retail basically got constipated overnight. And so people wanted to move this stuff. Uh, so I think 
there was a lot of excitement. There was a lot of room in that market. The market is growing. Um, I'm not negative on any players in the sector, but I think you're really going to see a bifurcation. And I talk to a lot of women about this as well because it is predominated by women uh, buyers. I'm not saying men don't buy, but predominantly. Guilt men's is, Guilt yeah. Men's, yeah, <laughs> sure. Uh, whatever. Uh, so what I would say to you is this, is um, I think everyone signed up for two or three or four or five of these when they started. First of all, I don't think they're going to sign up for the next five. So it's going to be hard for new entrants. Mm -hmm. So maybe we're going to focus on the four or five that exist now. But I think I think women will start to end up centering around one or two. And so maybe there will be two winners. But even in most categories, the outsized winner usually looks pretty big. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I think. I would be a seller if I were not number one. If I were number one, I think I would probably go to become a big company. The rumors, by the way, I, I, sometimes these things happen when you're not paying attention, but the last I saw, Amazon was rumored to be trying to buy Vente Privé yeah. for $3 billion. Hmm. It's a pretty good payday. Absolutely. Um, maybe now the price will be imagine. $10 billion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this was already six or eight months ago. <laughs> uh, I just want to say, if you're interested in asking us questions, if you send out a tweet with the hashtag TWIVC, this week in venture capital, or we like to call it Twivacy. <laughs> if you send out a tweet with hashtag Twivacy, uh, we have a team that will be standing by and we'll look at your questions and we'll try to answer some of those. So if it's a question for Dana, for me, about the market, about any deals, I'm gonna be looking for questions. But until I see one come up, I'm gonna move on to the deals. Excellent. The first one I wanna talk about, and we'll try to do these a bit faster, is called Booyah. As that's the name of the company. The product is called My Town. Just announced a deal of $20 million of total funds. That's $30 million in terms of how much they've raised to date. The original investors, or at least prior to this round, were Kleiner Perkins. This round includes Axel, uh, Jim Breyer uh, joining the board, who as, is on the board of Walmart, Dell, and Facebook. What do you think of Booyah? So, um, you know, look, this is clearly a phenomenon that, um, I mean, if you look at, just look at the sheer numbers, um, a lot of people are starting to uh, check in on all of these services. Um, I have to say, I'm definitely the least cool person on the planet as it relates to all of these services yeah. because I've yet to become a mayor of anything. But maybe. But, but it might be cool. <laughs> it might be cool might if you're be not cool. a mayor. <laughs> yeah, I'm starting a new cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, but look, I mean, clearly there there is a lot of traction around these. I think, though, if you just sort of look at the number of competitors in the market that you know, all do have real, uh, real traction. If you know, in Foursquare, which was sort of the original um, check-in service, uh, and uh, and uh, Gowalla, and you know, sort of all of these different um, uh, companies that have popped up. I guess the question to me is just, you know, twenty million dollars. I mean, now total of almost thirty million raised. Um, I, you know, it, clearly it goes beyond being just kind of a game and a check-in service, and there is a lot of value in understanding, you know, for local businesses to sort of understand who are their most loyal customers, et cetera, and, you know, sort of having that data and being able to then offer them, you know, I think that uh, uh, Booyah was the one that did the deal with H&M, and, you know, I think, like, doing things like that where you can start to offer real discounts, I mean, it's sort of a, a real-time couponing-type business. You know, it's interesting. The difference to me from how I understand my town is Foursquare had a model, which is I go to my local restaurant, my local cafe, and I check in, and I can become the mayor. Okay. My town seemed to have a model that was more of a game. I mean, mm -hmm. I know that's a game, yeah. but it's a simplistic game. <clears throat> my town's game, I'm, I understand, works more like Monopoly, and the truth is I don't use these tools. Um, that works more like Monopoly, and the interesting thing being you can take ownership, let's say, of a retail store, <clears throat> and like Monopoly, if you put a hotel on it, you can then charge other people who sure. land on your property. <clears throat> they also have had much more of a focus on a gaming element to it. Mm -hmm. So where Foursquare seems to be more about location-based services, where are your friends, crowds, you know, where is everybody? This seems to be much more of a social game. Like Gowalla as well. <clears throat> I mean, as far as being able to sort of, you know, collect all of these, you know, sort of the virtual items and things when you go to the check-in in different places. You yeah. Know. So. And, and, and the gaming element of Monopoly and charging people and so on and so forth, the interesting thing for me is a third of their revenue today they claim is coming from virtual goods. Mm -hmm. 
And when I think about virtual goods, they're, they're serving up 250 million impressions per month of virtual goods. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that means they're putting 250 mm -hmm. million impressions saying, you know, you can buy these virtual mm -hmm. goods. And even if 1.5% of those or 0.7% of those are converting, that's pure profit margin mm -hmm. because the variable costs on that's near zero. And we've seen businesses, I mean, the obvious one being Zynga, that go from once you have a user base and start selling virtual goods to just crazy amount of revenues overnight is phenomenal. Absolutely. That must be what's behind this. Well, that's, I mean, cl clearly. And I think the only <clears throat> reason that I sort of point to the amount of money raised in the competition is that, I mean, unlike, well, I guess it is sort of like Zynga, but, you know, to a certain degree, this still requires you when you're out to be doing something I mean are you going to you know are you only going to um, check in on Booyah or you know what about Foursquare and all the others I mean I think a lot of people have signed up for multiple services are you gonna sort of sit down at a restaurant and check into four places I mean you know so there becomes that element of is it you know at a certain point do people lose interest in, in doing that and therefore you know do you sort of lose the impressions mm -hmm. I don't know you know, I think about all the people who play Farmville. I've never played it once, I have to admit. That either makes me cool or uncool. Yeah, I think you and I are equally uncool. I, yeah, <laughs> or I, cool. I've got, I've got kids. I don't have time for Farmville. But um, I can but, say I do now yeah, as well. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> kid, congratulations. Kid, kid. kid. Um, and, uh, no, but the idea of people getting engaged in a game uh, and then taking that game into a mobile world and where mobile meets physical, I just find that fascinating. The, fascinating. the interesting thing I would tell you, 2.1 million users already. Yeah. Compare that to the company that gets all the press, Foursquare. Last reported number I saw was 1 million users. Yeah. And they're projecting, and these are just projections, they're projecting 6 million on my town by this summer. I think you're going to start hearing a lot more about my town. I totally agree. I mean, but but it is just a question of you know, is that does this become more of a winner takes all from the standpoint of just you know how much time does a person have and you know where are they going to spend it? So okay, so that's booyah. Let's talk about another deal. Uh, this deal is called Buzzfeed. Buzzfeed just raised eight million dollars, led by RRE, based out of New York. I presume mm -hmm. you know those guys well. It also has money from Founder Collective, mm -hmm. uh, Chris Dixon, Katarina Fake, Eric Paley, a number of these people. You went? Did you uh, go to school with Eric? That's what yes. I thought. I thought I remembered. And that. Chris. Oh, and Chris. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, both MBA or undergrad? MBA. MBA. Yep. Gotcha. Uh, it's always this tight knit little kind of cliques that come out of Harvard and Stanford, <laughs> isn't it? Well, Eric actually founded a company with one of my former section mates, uh, Micah okay. Rosenblum, who is not part of the Founder Collective, but is you know is working with them on things as well. So it's a very small world. <laughs> it is a small world, that's for sure. Um, so they put eleven and a half million dollars now in total have gone into BuzzFeed. The idea is that they help publishers to and maybe traditional publishers to help promote their stories and create buzz on the internet, some of which is maybe through social media, some of it is can we help you using tools to get better placement on Dig or on StumbleUpon to drive traffic. So if you're traditional media, the idea is BuzzFeed will help you get the buzz. It was set up by one of the co-founders of Huffington Post, Jonah Peretti, mm -hmm. and you guys actually invested in Huffington Post, yes. so you yes. must know Jonah. Yes. So what do you think of BuzzFeed? So, um, so look, I think that um, Jonah is a fantastic guy, and he was, you know, one of the early tech, you know, sort of early technical founders. And um, <clears throat> when he was, you know, setting up BuzzFeed, I think it's a, I think it is a great concept. I think he did this phenomenally well for Huffington Post. Okay. So I think he clearly understands um, the the market and opportunity. Um, uh, and you know, I guess what. I'm not sure of, and I'm just a little bit out of date on the company, to be honest, is, um, you know, there. it seems like there are a bunch of little businesses sort of popping up doing this, and I think there will be more and more. Um, I think they were one of the early uh, companies doing it. I don't know, you know, I know that they have a number of sites that they go to, I don't know if it's exclusively or if they have exclusives with them in the same, you know, sense almost as sort of a um, an ad market, but I, uh, you know, I think that there is clearly opportunity here because companies do need to figure out their social strategies and they do need to you know get get sort of traffic in the social networks etc and be able to track them with the analytics um, you know how much people are going to be willing to pay for it etc is is you know I think we're still in early days
Gotcha. Let's talk about another deal. This is a deal I was going to put as the deal of the week. Perhaps I should have. It's a, it's a company that I just love uh, the idea of called Simple Geo. Simple Geo just raised $8 million from Redpoint. They've raised $10 million in total. They had investment from Foundry Group, from First Round Capital, from Chris Saka of Lowercase Capital, founded by Joe Stump from Boulder. Uh, I understand Joe was formerly the technical leader at DIG. And uh, in effect, what they're doing, Dana, as you know, is uh, it is, well, as the name says, Simple Geo, it's location-based services, and LBS, as people call it, it, it's a very hot category. We've already talked about it. You not only have my town, uh, you know, we've got Foursquare, we've got Koala, we've got Looped, we've got everyone else, but the idea is if you're an application company or you want to launch an application, are you going to actually build in all of the local lo LBS-type services like who are the other businesses that are nearby? Uh, how do I loop into other users who might be nearby? Mm -hmm. how, do I, how do I map that location aware? So if you imagine it, that you've got a user on one side, an application on another, as an application company, I'm going to know who my users are. I'm going to know where, they're, where they are. But then I can loop into an API that will call out and give me a set of services to offer a better mm -hmm. offering. So to take to take one of these awful kind of VC terms or, or industry terms, it's a platform, <laughs> but it is a platform and I find it interesting. The one other thing I would like to add is that their nearest competitor, I'm trying to remember the name, it was Mixer Labs, but they had a product name, uh, Geo API, mm -hmm. was bought by Twitter. So obviously a hot sure. space. Any views on Simple Geo? You know, this is I have to admit that you know reading this week was the first that I had read about the company. I didn't know it, sure. um, and uh, I'd just be curious about who are their, you know, sort of who are their large application customers right now. I think it's an. I mean, I think it's, it's great to sort of. It's a brand new company. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so the question you could ask, yeah. which you've been asking, is do they need eight million dollars? I, I want to I want to talk about it, a use case. I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> there is a company that I really like uh, that is actually using this product. So um, there's a company called I think it's Sticky Bite, Sticky Bit, Sticky Bits. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen the product, even though I'm buggering the name. Uh, it's in effect what you can do is you can put stickers on goods, mm -hmm. and those stickers are scannable. And so sure. if you put the sticker, sticky bits, is sti yep. sticky yeah. bits yeah, yeah. is what I think it's yeah. called. And you put a sticky bit on and you can scan it. And that scanning it tells you something about the item and the person interacting with the item. Because we talk a lot about check into a business or I interact with another human being. The idea is I can make many objects location aware. Those mm -hmm. objects might move. I might be able to track them and I might be able to scan them. What was interesting to me is when sticky bits launched, on the one side, it used Simple Geo as a platform to have all of these location-based services tied into the service. And on the other side, they linked in with a company called Occipital. And what Occipital is, is a scanning technology. Mm -hmm. This has become a huge phenomenon. Yep. Millions of downloads. Sure. Um, that, the Occipital company, they did two things. The one I noticed first, it, it came out of Techstars out of Boulder. So. You know, we talk about New York, L.A., Boulder, Boulder Midway is. seems to be a very interesting market uh, for startups. Um, and they did a product called Food Scanner. And the idea was you could scan food at your store or something you're about to eat. You scan the UPC code, the barcode, and it would feed into a product called Daily Burn and tell you how many mm -hmm. calories yeah. and all the yeah. makeup and all that kind of stuff. So Occipital is a company launched Food Scanner, then they launched, launched this product called Red, La Red Laser. What Sticky Bits did is they said, well, <clears throat> we can focus on what we want to focus on. Simple Geo on the one side, Red Laser for scanning on the other side, and they can be really focused, and these platforms help you as an application to launch faster. I'm missing what Sticky Bits did. So does. what they did- Maybe it doesn't they, matter. They but have these just... stickers, they have <laughs> yeah. these stickers yeah. that you put on items. Physical items? Physical items. Okay. And it allows people to be able to scan that. So they have like then, some sort of unique code? Yeah. I mean, is it actually yeah, a barcode? Or is it an actual barcode. Yeah, okay. And where they want to take this, I don't know. Okay. Um, so when I, I played around with the website and was trying to find out how you might use this, I mean, I, I don't know what the use case they have in mind is. Yeah. But what interests me, 
I think it's a cool concept, the idea, because in a Twitter world, we're interacting with human beings in there's real time. There's no that there's yeah. value to the Interacting GOPs. with objects, yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and anyway, well, you asked for a company. I just wanted to point yep, that out. That's it. an okay. example. Okay. And the idea is that there's going to be a lot of companies in the future mm -hmm. that are going to want location-based services, and Simple Geo is going to give them a platform for launching faster for providing essentially all of the geo data yeah is that i mean that's right yeah geo data so, so, so that i mean map, that i think is i do think map, is valuable the there's no question to me that lots of applications will need it and that they probably won't want to all build it themselves so I yes agree. there you okay. go <laughs> uh and there's not a lot of competition as i understand it to uh, simple geo today okay next deal i want to talk about is and i'm not seeing any questions coming across <laughs> on our monitor that either means no one Nobody's at all watching. is interested. it's well, okay maybe maybe <laughs> Uh, or people are just aren't asking questions or it's not coming through. But if you want to ask, I promise if I see a question on there, we will address it. Um, Lookout. Now, when I first got the deal on Lookout and I read who funded it, $11 million. You know there's a theme here? The theme is big rounds are back, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, absolutely. Well, this oh is, my God. Yeah, every single round has been over $10, $10 million. million. $11 yeah. million, $35 yeah. Million. Yeah. Big rounds are back. I think uh, uh, VC has found I guess that means, I guess that, found means that the legs, billion right? dollar exits are going to be back too because Let's those hope. come hand in hand, right? Yes, I guess so. <laughs> um, and what interested me, so Axel did, led the round. They've raised $16.5 million in total previously from Koshla Ventures. And I saw Koshla and I thought, man, this is bad. What Lookout does, and I'll tell you why I thought it was bad, what they do is backup, SaaS, meaning software as a service, backup and security for smartphones, for mobile devices. And I thought, I know Kosla funded a company called Flexilis, led by a really interesting team, the CEO being John Heron, Herring. And I said, how can they fund Lookout and Flexilis? That's wrong. There's a name change, name change, same company. <laughs> so tricky. <laughs> uh, Flexilis was started by a group of people out of USC in Los Angeles, I lamented the fact that they weren't funded by a mobile SaaS company in LA that you didn't. Well, it, it, <laughs> I think it and largely, I, <laughs> I have to look at the dates, founded in 2007. I got into venture capital in 2007, so I'll excuse myself. Where were what, you, what Dana? What was my excuse? Where were what you? was my excuse? Listen, but we were Los, just getting started. Los Angeles-based company. And by the way, I know both Coastal and Trilogy well, and you know, yeah, now and I sort of call. feel hurt. Yeah. Should we publish your phone number, your email but, address? Yeah. <laughs> but look, here's here's a great story that I think people will appreciate hearing. They were coming out of USC. Uh, maybe they hadn't even graduated. They wanted to make the market aware of <clears throat> themselves and the service they wanted to build. So what they did is they took backpacks. Do you know this story? No. They took backpacks to the red carpet at the Oscars. I think I have heard this. With story. technology yeah, in the yeah. backpack, and they read data on all the awesome. phones of all the stars, and they didn't publish all the data, but they showed the press what they had. It's awesome. And they said, this is how unsecure your data is, right? And I thought, Frickin' smart guys, Brilliant. right? Yeah. And uh, that's obviously, you know, again, I have to blame you here because you should be reading, you know, these, I, these I, websites, right? I understand, right? I understand. My wife just lives on TMZ and uh, OMG and all these. Absolutely. So I you should have seen that I one. do remember the story yeah. now, but okay. I didn't know that it was that this was company. Them. These yes. are the guys. Okay. And what they were out to prove is how unsecure mobile devices are. I that only women read those websites, by the way. <laughs> women and gay men, right? Let's be honest, okay? Not that there's anything wrong with it. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time there. And very smart what women. What do you do? You're not on Gawala. You're not on, you know. <laughs> I'm a geek. I keep a blog, you know. It, it sucks well, that's up. right. That's it right. sucks up my free time. It sucks up 10.30 p.m. to 12 midnight. And you've got a talk show. Yes, I do. <laughs> that sucks up at least an hour. Um, um, but so I found it fascinating they did that and instantly I got it and what I got is this is semantic for mobile devices and as we take lots of pictures and have those pictures of our kids uh, of other things uh, maybe of naughty things on our phones not me uh, other people uh, we don't guys. want yeah guys <laughs> we don't want people knowing that this actually exists yeah. Uh, it's got uh, our phone numbers of our friends and all this data, and we're just going to have more on these devices. Yeah. I've always been surprised that there hasn't been, you know, a great sort of ubiquitous backup service just in general for yeah. cell phones. And you know, I know that each device and each carrier sort of has its own, but um, you know, I think that this will be a huge problem going forward. Congratulations to the team at Lookout. Uh, 
you we, have we, my number, you have my email address, <laughs> next time call me. We wish that you had stayed in LA. I think you should call yourself My Lookout because I looked on the net and your website is My Lookout. I think you should call yourself My Lookout, but I did notice that lookout.com is a placeholder website, so maybe you guys are, are currently negotiating for that. There's a question. <laughs> We have a question. Excellent. Our opinion on the associated content acquisition by Yahoo from EFCON, E-F-F-C-O-H-N. No. Now, we can say associated content was purchased by Yahoo. Yes. It was announced this week. Uh, it was reported as $100 million, and then it got backtracked. It's actually a $90 million acquisition with a $10 million earnout, or at least that's what people think uh, the acquisition is. Do you know this company, Associated Content? I, I know the company. I don't know, um, you know, not not intimately. Okay. Um, but um, you know, I think it's an interesting interesting deal for Yahoo. I think um, I was a little surprised it was Yahoo and not AOL. Most people say it was very uninteresting. Yeah. The analyst. Uh, I, I, I think. I mean, is interesting like a word that you choose to be polite? Interesting is you, you know if you sort Yahoo? of look at no if you sort of look at Yahoo right now. I mean, they're clearly. They're clearly struggling, right. clearly sort of looking for you know a big opportunity, and um, focusing a lot on content and on having exclusive some you know access to exclusive content. Uh, it feels to me like um, you know a little bit just like grasping and sort of grappling. Listen, associated content was up for sale for two to three years, no but no bites. Um, it's clear that what's happening on the internet is, as Michael Arrington, I think fairly, called it the McDonald's of content, the creating of McDonald's of content. And what he meant was, because uh, I had this discussion with my partners, we looked at a couple companies in this space, and my partners looked at the content that was produced and said, that's not interesting. I said, yeah, but you don't eat McDonald's every day, do you? Yeah. But the rest of the country exactly. does. And the kind of stuff that people want to read is not as sophisticated as you must be reading on TMZ. <laughs> And it's not as, uh, I had to say it. Your wife and I. Yeah, exactly. Well, no, my wife does read it, and she loves it. Uh, she is a very oh, smart cookie. I read cookie. it as well. Let's she, be she's honest. She's a smart cookie. She worked at Google for several years. Um, uh, I, you know, she gets jobs that I couldn't have got because her uh, grades were better, and she went to Wharton, and I went to University of Chicago. But um, I would say this. Uh, I believe that market is going to happen. You've got demand media in town that's investing a lot in new forms of content production. AOL, Tim Armstrong went there and said, we are gonna invest in new ways of lower cost content production. I said I was surprised it wasn't AOL versus yes. Yahoo. Well, that AOL my, reportedly was, said yeah. they didn't wanna buy yeah. it because they thought they could build it, which yeah. is the criticism yeah. Yahoo got. I don't know, maybe it'll be a good acquisition. What these guys are good at doing, there's also Gather based in Boston. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they help you to get access to low cost writers who can produce content that is designed to be SEO friendly. Right. And what that means is people go to Google, they type a search term in, what appears high on the list? Well, if you understand from a set of tools that you're given as a writer, what's gonna appear high on that list, it is gonna drive what gets read. And the, the dilemma that we all face is, in a world where McDonald's subsumes search, how do people find the good stuff or maybe the elite stuff? Right, but I mean, I, look, I think, you know, the reason that I said interesting and that I do feel like it's kind of grasping is that th it's true that it is sort of the com mass commodity of, of content, but, um, you know, things move quickly yeah. online. And I think that we are already, even the, you know, the mass market is yeah. really sort of moving away from that and I think are more sophisticated. I think it's not giving enough credit to, you know, people as far as, you know, being able to find content in lots of different places. and. Yahoo has not been growing right. recently, to so, the best of my knowledge. <laughs> no disrespect, to Yahoo. <laughs> and and, and it, it may be that this is a tool that will help okay. them grow. We'll see. I want to do a couple deals really quickly, then I'm going to come to a question that's being asked by Domain Noob, by Domain Noob who has uh, uh, sent me lots of tweets, and, uh, and we've had an interesting ongoing okay. discussion. I want to pick up Domain Noob's uh, question. Uh, I want to do a couple deals, and I want to do them quickly because they're ones I've talked about before. Mm -hmm. Jelly, yeah. J-E-L-L-I. Uh, I love the founding team here, yeah. uh, a guy named Mike Doherty. Uh, I never know if I say that right because I have a friend named Doherty, and I think he says Doherty. Um, uh, anyway, Mike, uh, congratulations. He was uh, on the Tell Me team before, and he also was an ex-banker uh, like you. Um, 
don't know that I'd say that I was a banker having spent two years there when I was. <laughs> he only spent a couple of years yeah. too, but That's you, great. That's you right. can run, but yeah, you can't exactly. hide from your background. You know, it's one of those things like everyone I used to be. Proudly. You know, people used to be proud to be <laughs> bankers, but these days it's not. You know, it's the kind of thing you hide on your resume. Um, but also Jatine, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. I think it's Parekh. Um, both of these guys are really smart people. Jatine was on the Amazon Kindle team. I think he was one of the original, if not the original person on the uh, Amazon Kindle team, one of the original. And what Jelly does is it provides crowdsourced radio. And what I mean is you go to the internet and it allows you to control what's seen on, what's listened to on terrestrial radio mm -hmm. as well as internet radio. I love the model. It was funded um, $7 million from Battery Ventures, previous investors, first round capital. Also, um, Peter Spurling, who I know very well, uh, who um, was one of the co-founders of University of Phoenix. Mm -hmm. A lot of interesting people. <coughs> Truth be it told, I did want to invest in this company for a variety of reasons we never got there, um, but I wish them well. I think they will do very well. We did look at Jelly as well, and I will say, I mean, I think that I love the the concept and the service. I think the biggest question with all of these is just business model. Yeah. That's, uh, I mean, and ad supported, I understand, but it's, it's not there yet. But I love the product I, and service. I know the vision of where they want to take it, and it's very aligned with my vision of where a lot of money is going to be made. I think they're going to do well. You heard my prediction here. Uh, and, and I know, look, anytime you're creating something totally new, there's going to be skeptics. Because I called a lot of people from the radio industry, industry who are skeptical. We'll see. We'll see. I'm betting on it. Uh, not with my money. Um, <laughs> you I would have. have. I would have. Grocket is another company I'm really proud of that got funded. Um, uh, an incredibly nice and smart founder, Farb Nivy, brother of Babak Nivy, who runs Venture Hacks. Mm -hmm. Farb, what's interesting, I always look for domain knowledge, and he was very senior in the curriculum at both Princeton Review and Kaplan, mm -hmm. and they're creating a new model of training people, online education, particularly around, uh, right now, around GMATs and LSATs and all the entry exams into uh, business school, law school, um, in med school, uh, but they have a lot bigger plans. They raised seven million dollars from Atlas. Uh, previous invents, investors were Benchmark and Integral Capital. Uh, they compete with Newton, another company I like a lot, and I think those will be good competitors. And there's room in the market. Congratulations to Far, very proud. And I do want to do one last thing. Uh, we're going to have one last deal, but I want to talk about the question, which is discuss local data privacy issues, because we've been talking a lot about LBS. What are the privacy issues that we should be thinking about, and how do you think about that? I, I mean, I think it's the, I mean, it's the clearly the biggest question, biggest issue sort of of the day. I mean, there's such a, you know, on the one hand, trans, we're sort of heading into just massive transparency. Yeah. On the other hand, people are still very sensitive about their, their privacy. I mean, you know, I, I guess, uh, personally, I sort of look at it and, um, we all know that all of our information is is out there. Scary. I mean, it's scary on the one hand. On the other hand, it's sort of too late. I mean, to to say that the you know local data privacy issues are just sort of hitting right now is I feel like naive. I mean, it's it's. But it, there's a new element to it, right? Because they knew lots about us on the internet, a lot more than people thought. I mean, the whole idea of retargeting that cookies. Yeah, exactly, and that, I mean, they everybody's know the watching site. everything that you do, don't be. But I know, but they were watching what you were doing on the internet before, and with LBS. It's actual physical. Physical, yeah, I, I just I wanna, give, I wanna give you an example, okay, Dana? I used to use a product, no, I do use a product called Uber Twitter, which is a Twitter client on BlackBerry, and unbeknownst to me, at the time, they don't do it any longer. If you did a short tweet, because you know in Twitter you have 140 characters, if you did a short tweet like 15 characters or you know 60 characters, what they were doing is inserting a link into your tweet when it got published out with your location mm -hmm. without asking, asking me, hmm. and they put it in. And so when you think about a BlackBerry client, often I yeah. use it on the road, but sure. look, sometimes I'm sure. in bed and I wake up and I'm sort of checking my sure. my tweets or whatever. And one day I look and it's like it plotted my house. And I'm like, blimey. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I mean, look, I think, the, but the reality is that 
that's not going to be the only thing yeah. either. I mean, I, I do feel like it's, you know, now it's kind of how do we live and how do we sort of manage ourselves and, and our behavior in a world where... Shortly, there are going to be successful startups that build businesses in helping us to manage, to manage our privacy. Absolutely. I haven't seen them. They probably exist. I they haven't totally pitched to agree. me yet, but I think but it's a big will. growth area. I want to do one last company, um, and that is a company called Huddle. Huddle. And Huddle raised another big round. $10.2 million from Matrix Partners. They had previously raised about $5 million. Eden Ventures uh, had invested $4 million in the company. What they do is, you know, I think the press on them when they started was WebEx killer or go to meeting killer, right? So they do a little bit of that, like the group sharing. They do a little bit of project management, I think a la 37 Signals. They do a little bit of file sharing, a la Google Docs and spreadsheets. Um, the guy who invested is a guy who I've heard nothing but good things about, Josh Hanna. Josh founded a company called Flutter when I was living in the UK. Mm -hmm. He sold it to Betfair. Betfair is now a major company sure. in online gambling. Uh, he works for Matrix uh, now. He's the lead on this deal. How does this deal sound to you? Well, it's definitely an area um, that I haven't spent a lot of time. I think that this is, you know, more in your bailiwick. So I, I, I'd sort of you throw defer? it back to you. Yeah. But uh, you know, look, I mean, it's, you know, Josh. No, I don't. Okay. So, so he has a very good reputation. Here's what I think about Huddle. I think. If someone was willing to put in $10 million, I hope that they have found some secret sauce and are doing tremendously well. I haven't used the product. It's a very hard space to make money in. Both of my companies were in that space. Uh, it is enterprise sales. It's long sales cycles. <clears throat> they are doing a lot of things. My advice to them would be narrow your scope and kill a few key categories. Because if you're gonna take on WebEx and them, I got news for you, Skype is gonna kick WebEx's ass. I mean, they have yeah. launched this new product that you can do screen sharing oh, yeah. on Skype. It's so cool. I'm not sure that's a marketplace I would be in. And I think it bifurcates and becomes a paid premium market and a free product. <clears throat> I'm just not sure how you do well unless they what have some they have hugely have that premium would make product. It, I mean, is there any kind of killer? Uh, yeah, so I'll tell you, if you want to charge for it, it's because you're doing things like people dialing in from five locations and you want to share screens from five locations. But that's saying Or if you want to do market. polling yeah. or if you want to do user feedback or if you want to integrate voice from multiple places mm -hmm. and be able to turn on and turn off different speakers. If you want advanced services, you can charge for it because Skype is never going to do that. Sure. There will be a bifurcation of the market. I'm not sure I'd be in either of those markets. And then there's online spreadsheets and documents. And we look at Google. I mean, they're going to yeah. make this stuff free. Zoho already makes it free. Um, I use a product called Edit Grid for online spreadsheets. Totally free. That's kind of a hard market. Then there's some element of are they going to compete with social text? Are they going to compete with Jive software? Are they going to compete with Yammer or Salesforce chat, chat, uh, Chatter? I don't know where they're going to focus. On the on the document sharing side, interestingly, Dropbox, yeah. phenomenal awesome. product. Yeah, absolutely. That's what my second company was going to become. Absolutely. We sold to Salesforce.com. They have just killed it. Simple concept. Exactly. You know exactly what My you're getting. My advice to yes. you, Huddle, uh, I read your bios. Yes. I looked at the company. I know it's UK-based. I lived there for 10 years. I love the UK. I'd love to see you succeed. Stay Narrow. focused. Deliver. And I hope to read great things about Huddle and, uh, and Josh, great guy. I'm going to bring it to a close, Dana. Uh, there were some M&A deals yep. this week. You know, get to those another day. Um, SAP buying Sybase. Groupon bought a European copy of Groupon called City Deal. Uh, I think we're going to run out of time, but I thank you very much for your participation thank today. You. Always a pleasure this to talk to you and hear your views. Thank you. Thanks.